wonderful group of people. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's really my pleasure to be here. So my task this morning is to give an overview about research and clinical updates for major mood and anxiety disorders in pregnancy. And I usually title this talk, uh, Treating Mood Disorders in Pregnancy, Are We Asking the Right Questions? And that's a, a kind of a prompt to think about a question that's really in two parts, which is, what are the, the negative elements of treating these disorders, particularly with pharmacology, because there's so much written in the field about that, versus the other question, which is what good are we doing? What is the difficulty with not treating women with treatments that are effective in pregnancy? And I know, you know listening to Diane's story, which you know, is, is really um, an amazing story. And, and you know, having done this for 30 years, I always hope that those stories won't happen again, that there will be you know, much more assertive screening and that people will be identified and that these tragic courses will be prevented. So something for all of us certainly to work for. So how common are these illnesses? Well, this group knows how common these illnesses are and how devastating they are. But what I want to emphasize is that it should be a concern for all people because this illness is incredibly common. It's a leading cause of disability, according to the World Health Organization. And for women, it's the major contributor to the burden of disease across the world. So this is something that isn't happening to somebody else out there. It's happening to all of us. And with a lifetime prevalence of one out of five women across their life, one out of eight men, we know that in this room there are many people who have suffered these illnesses and who have become advocates for doing better in terms of public health with these disorders. We also know very sadly and tragically that depression is associated with suicide. And in fact, some of the recent studies are now highlighting how common maternal death in the first postpartum year related to psychiatric illnesses. And in fact, it's more common than some of the obstetrical complications, such as anesthesia complications, postpartum hemorrhage. So that has led our obstetrical colleagues to pay more attention to these disorders. And in fact, there's an ACOG consensus statement out now that urges obstetricians to screen, refer, and get these patients treated. So in terms of epidemiology, women are twice as likely as men to get depressed across their lifespan. And what I think is incredibly interesting is that it's at puberty when the risk in women increases compared to men. And so we have this other group of patients, pubertal girls, who then develop a higher risk for depression. And if you look at this peak, it's during the childbearing years that women have a higher risk for depression. And I think of that as an epidemiologic injustice. You know, why is this that women during these years that we, you know, we hope are happy, wonderful years that the greeting cards that, you know, congratulate these women, why is that associated with such a high risk for depression? And we don't have a full answer to that, but we certainly know that the massive withdrawal of hormones at birth is a risk factor in triggering episodes for women. I put this slide up, not that people in this room don't know what major depression is, but I wanted to talk about how I think about this order and how I, I talk to patients about it. So there are two gatekeeper symptoms, depressed mood and diminished interest or pleasure, not being able to enjoy things. What Diane talked about, she couldn't enjoy things that she used to enjoy. Those are two gatekeeper symptoms. And one of the problems with calling this illness major depression is that you do not have to have the symptom of depression to qualify. So you'd have to be sad. And I occasionally get called, well, she can't be depressed because she's not sad. She hasn't done anything she's enjoyed in two months, but she's not. So understanding that there are a couple of gatekeeper symptoms and that this illness is named in a way, unfortunately, that creates some confusion is important. The other symptoms here, weight loss, weight gain, too little, too much sleep, agitation, can't sit down, pacing, or so slowed down you can barely move. To me, these are indications of the physiologic dysregulation of depression. So 
What other disorder can you have too much or too little, too much or too little of certain symptoms to qualify for the disorder? And I talk about this again as the physiologic dysregulation that stress, either internal physical massive withdrawal of hormones, no sleep for three days, that that stress dysregulates the body's rhythms. And you see these polarization of, the polarization of symptoms. And of course, these other uh, signs, fatigue, loss of energy, concentration difficulties. Um, we've had moms uh, trying to measure formula and you know, they put way more formula and they can't remember from scoop to scoop how much formula they've put in. So the concentration difficulties can be very substantial in this disorder. And uh, re the thoughts of death and suicide, again, uh, you know, I. I, I think that uh, we are not doing a good enough job screening across this country for these potentially uh, preventable disorders of our healthy mothers, our healthy young mothers. We need to be screening and, and preventing these tragedies because we know how to do that. We just need to do it. So I... Uh, one of the things I talk about with depression patients, and it's relevant to how they think about their management of depression in pregnancy, is the number of episodes that they've had. These data are quite clear that if a woman has an episode of depression, her risk of having another one is about 50 to 60 percent. So it can be an isolated episode, but once she has that vulnerability, just like any other disorder, her vulnerability increases. If she's had two episodes, it's 70%. If she's had three episodes, it's 90%. And that kind of person with recurrent episodes is really considered somebody who is eligible for a maintenance treatment to prevent episodes. So when women come to my office to think about how they're gonna manage a pregnancy, the number of episodes they've had before is incredibly important. And of the recurrent studies that we have, although there are some disparate findings, one common finding is if they've had four or more episodes prior to that pregnancy, and that can be postpartum or non-postpartum episodes, the risk for recurrence is very high and maintenance treatment is appropriate. The other concept that is the important and new in the sense of uh, research studies is we used to say, a woman getting 50% better, that is if her symptom score went down by half, that was a response, that was good. We now know that unless the person is in remission, good, solid recovery, minimal symptoms function, that her risk for getting sick again is, very, is high. So we now are really pushing treating to remission. That's interesting in the context of childbearing because the temptation is to say, oh, well, you know, she wants to get pregnant, let's minimize the dose, or she's breastfeeding, let's minimize the dose, in which case what you often have is a partially treated depression and exposure to both the illness and the medicine. So these kinds of epidemiologic facts are important in helping women make decisions. To talk briefly about the blues, uh, I... In my practice, which is an academic tertiary care setting, I don't see this anymore. I used to years ago. But it seems to me that, that people, obstetricians, uh, people in our communities are much more aware of the baby blues, which is transient. And my rule is gone by day 10. And if it's getting worse across time, has the woman has suicidality, complete loss of function, it's not the blues. It's an early sign of depression. So again, I don't see this very much. But I know that you all probably do. And I think for women with the blues, what I do, is, if I think it is the blues or what I used to do, is to educate them about depression partner with them and somebody in their world to monitor them. And as it disappears, great. If it doesn't, call. The other serious illness is uh, postpartum psychosis, of course. And this is one to two per thousand births. That's what's in the literature uh, as a rate. Uh, it's not that well established because it's from epidemiologic studies in which the presentation is usually hospitalization. So other more subtle forms, I believe, are relatively undetected or hopefully treated before they become uh, before the woman has to be hospitalized. So I did a study quite a long time ago about in which I asked the question. 
is postpartum psychosis different than psychosis at any other time in a woman's life? And the answer was yes. And that was uh, in agreement with a number of other studies that were done in the UK. And the, the thing that's most interesting is that the psychosis looks like it's organic, meaning, you know, she's confused. They have unusual symptoms like um, uh, tactile hallucinations, which are relatively unusual in disorders like schizophrenia, uh, d s uh, olfactory hallucinations or smelling things that aren't there, very bizarre delusions. And, uh, you know, to me, it looks like cases that I used to see when I was in a more general medical setting of steroid withdrawal. You know, you'd have steroid withdrawal psychosis, and, and there are some hypotheses about what this may be. My approach to this now is to look for organic causes of psychosis that look like typical postpartum psychosis, one being an inborn error of metabolism called urea cycle disorders. Though there are case reports of women presenting with psychosis that have this disorder, and every woman that has psychosis needs to be screened with an ammonia level, a serum ammonia level, which will identify this illness. So what we're trying to do now is is look at what are the identifiable causes that are treatable so we can take those out, treat them appropriately, because the treatment for urea cycle disorder is not the same as for a psychosis like we typically think of that's usually a bipolar spectrum illness. This, of course, is Andrea Yates, uh, who remains in a psychiatric facility and who through a tragedy of her own, though, prompted us to look very carefully at the way we treat such patients legally. And in Illinois, uh, a state that requires by law perinatal depression screening, we also passed a law in which we now, uh, that will take effect in June, in which women who have committed a felony during the first year postpartum can petition to have their sentences mitigated, reduced, uh, be based on a diagnosis of postpartum or perinatal depression. So there are some advances, but they're too slow. Here is, here is uh, a, I put this uh, reference in its uh, article that was published last December. It's a review of postpartum psychosis. And uh, I have to say there's very little research data in there because it's a step to study at one to two per thousand births. This was a collaboration between Natalie Rasgon, who's at Stanford, me and a, a Dutch investigator, Fairly Berging, putting our ideas together over our careers about how what we have seen and what we think is useful. The important points here are uh, postpartum psychosis, in my mind, is always bipolar disorder. That diagnosis is always that, a cyclical mood disorder until proven otherwise, either an organic illness or some other illness. And it is really women with bipolar disorder who are vulnerable to postpartum psychosis. Our experience is that lithium uh, is, for many women, a very effective and rapid treatment, better than antipsychotics. Certainly, ECT is also an extremely good treatment for this disorder, and I think early identification and treatment is critical. I talk about uh, obsessional thoughts, and uh, I'll put OCD here, but I'm just going to talk about obsessional thoughts now. One of the problems that we see is that Women have obsessional thoughts. Usually, what if I put the baby in the microwave? I'm cutting a tomato. What if I stab the baby with a knife? And they are immediately distressing, upsetting to these women. They have their husbands put the knives in the garage, lock them away. They're, they're petrified they're going to do something. That, that is characteristic of this illness, that in obsessional thoughts, that thought occurs out of the blue. The woman recognizes it as something that's happening in her own brain. It's not put into her brain. She's upset by it. Different from psychosis, where that thought might occur. And it doesn't create that, you know, gee, I would never do that approach. And there's, in obsessional thoughts, there's no other signs of psychosis, no hallucinations, no other delusions. Those obsessional thoughts occur in about 50% of new moms, maybe even higher. One of my OBGYN colleagues did a study of obsessional thoughts postpartum. Probably many in the women, of the women in this room that have had kids have experienced those. So I think it's sort of a dysregulation of the serotonin system with birth. But when that gets to an extreme and the woman is depressed, you see those kinds of obsessional thoughts that are 
uh, troubling in the context of depression. So these obsessional thoughts as a symptom are common in depression. They're differentiated from psychosis because they're so distressing. There's no other signs of psychosis in the moms. And uh, they're treatable with the same treatments that one would use for postpartum depression. Then there is obsessive compulsive disorder, which, is, which I see pretty commonly in my practice. And it's often women who have onset in childhood or adolescence where they say, oh, yeah, you know, I've had these thoughts for a long time. They've gotten worse. They get worse with stress. I have compulsive rituals. All my closets are ordered in a particular way. I, I uh, uh, say three prayers before I do something. Th these kinds of rituals that are part of the disorder. It can be, though, the first onset postpartum. That can occur as well. In my experience, it's a little more rare than somebody with sort of low-level OCD, and it gets worse postpartum. Those women with anxiety disorders, like obsessive compulsive disorder, are also more likely to have a superimposed depression. So there is a, a lot of discussion about, well, is it anxiety, is, de is it depression? And my response to that is yes, because they're almost, they're really impossible to differentiate, and the treatments for them are often fairly similar, and it's much more important to get that woman identified and treated. So I uh, wanted to find out how common these illnesses were in a population in Pittsburgh. So this was at McGee Women's Hospital. It was a NIH-funded study, and what we did was we had uh, nurses and social workers on the unit stay an extra two hours after their shift, talk to women about postpartum depression after they delivered, and offer them a screening call at four to six weeks postpartum with the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. So, you know, the women, as you can imagine, I mean, this group's very sensitive. This women said, oh, wow, you mean you're asking me about me, how I'm doing? And they were really quite appreciative of the opportunity to be screened. We also got a number of calls from women before four to six weeks saying, I'm in trouble. You know, I have your number. I'm in trouble. Can I get in? So it was a really wonderful program. When we did the screens, women who had a 10 or more, which is a relatively low threshold for the EPDS, women who had a 10 or more were offered a home visit. So my staff would go out, do a full psychiatric assessment, provide resources, referrals, get them into treatment. If they didn't, if they weren't able to get to treatment, they would help them brainstorm, they would call with them, help them get into treatment. And what we found, we did 10,000 of those screens and 826 home visits. So I'll talk about this in a minute, but we had 10,000 deliveries. 14% of women had 10 or more. That's one out of seven. And of those 1,400 women, we had 826 who said, yes, come to my home, help me, and diagnose me. So we have screen positive rates and diagnoses for these patients. So uh, you all know about the, the EPDS, which is in your packet. It's uh, an interesting measure. When I first saw it, I didn't like it. I didn't want to use it because it's very sort of British worded. <laughs> so, so we did a comparison of three measures, the CESD, the, the PHQ-9, and this tool. And we looked at what did women prefer to fill out, hands down. EPDS was the one they filled out. It's the only one that was filled out completely. The other measures had blood. So uh, I am a real advocate now, and it's available in multiple languages, which is very helpful for our work in Chicago, and I'm sure here as well. So in our study then, here is a, a graph of the scores. <laughs> so this is zero, and then this is you know five or less. So lots of women here with not a positive score. If we go to 10, this is the 14% above this red line who scored positive. If we go to 13, which is a usual clinical measure, that's uh, 7%. Usually, again, clinically, a higher cutoff, like 13, is typically re recommended. So this is the distribution of EPDS scores in a large population that is a, a demographically pretty variable uh, population in Pittsburgh with rural and urban mothers involved. This is just showing what we already know, uh, basically that resourced women 
are more likely to have a negative EPDS score, not screen positive for depression, than women who have a disadvantage. The women who score positive tended to be more minority, less educated, more publicly insured, and less likely to be married. Indicative of you know, less resources overall being a stress risk factor for this dysregulation that we call depression. We asked these moms at four to six weeks postpartum, when did this episode begin? And true to the epidemiology, 40% of those women said, boy, right after the birth of this baby, I started not feeling well. That's when it began. But we also had a population of women who had, about a third of them had the onset at some point in pregnancy. And then we had the more chronically depressed women who were depressed even before, who tended to get worse in the post-birth period. And so, this is a study that we did a while ago. Now certainly screening in pregnancy or routine screening at yearly medical exams is a much better uh, screening practice. As far as the diagnoses, uh, we found again, true to the epidemiology, that the vast majority of these women had the illnesses for which they were presenting were major mood disorders. And if you said, well, what is the most common diagnosis that these women had? It was major depression, not first episode recurrent, superimposed on an anxiety disorder. So it isn't just depression, anxiety. The most common illness is this already comorbid complex illness. Single episodes were more rare, but what was most striking was this. We picked up over 20% of women with bipolar disorder. So these are women who screen positive for depression. And then you do a careful diagnostic assessment and find many both diagnosed and undiagnosed bipolar disorder patients. So this is, uh, we designed another study that I'll talk about in a minute, because I think we in psychiatry have not done a very good job with our screening recommendations, right? We go out and say, screen with this measure. If they screen positive, ask the depression questions and treat them. We know that bipolar depression looks a lot like unipolar depression, and if they're treated, there is a risk for induction of mania and psychosis, particularly in the postpartum period if that's not identified. So uh, I'll tell you how we're going to, how we're trying to deal with that. Um, <laughs> the mood disorders questionnaire is a measure that was developed a while ago to screen for bipolar disorder, and you have uh, this, this is the you know, quick yes, no. These are symptoms of bipolar disorder, either now or in the past. And there are critical questions. Do these symptoms occur all at the same time? So we see a lot of false positives where women say, yeah, I have all of those, but I had that 20 years ago, I had that 10 years ago. They have to, seven or more have to occur at the same time. It's a quick screen, and the women do not seem to mind this. It also says, mood disorders. It doesn't say bipolar screen, because many women with a family history of bipolar disorder are very sensitive about that. And so it's a mood disorder screen. Um, have your relatives been diagnosed with bipolar disorder? Has anybody told you you have it? This would have been a really nice screen for Diane. Too bad she, she, it hadn't been yet incorporated into her screening. This one, I have a red X here. And I'll tell you why in a minute. I would actually ignore that one, that question in this uh, MDQ. And here's why. After we discovered this high rate of bipolar diagnosis in our sample, what we did was we decided to screen with both of them. So instead of just giving the EPDS, we gave the EPDS, a unipolar depression general screen, and the MDQ, a bipolar screen. Then we looked at if you give uh, the both of them, how likely are you to pick up the diagnosis that was made at the home visit where the person making that diagnosis, that clinician, did not know the screen results? And what we found was uh, the combination of the EPDS and the MDQ with the standard scoring, which includes that red X thing, um, picked up 50% of patients with bipolar disorder postpartum. When we eliminated that XX item, which is, do you have impairment? And we eliminated it because a lot of patients with hypomanemia don't see themselves as impaired. So we deleted that. We picked up then 70% of the patients with a bipolar diagnosis. And we picked up 
the patients with the more severe forms of bipolarity. So it's not perfect as a screening measure, but it's the best we have at this point. We're actually um, waiting for the publication of another measure that we hope is gonna improve the diagnosis further, but this is an area we really need to deal with very carefully in our screening for postpartum depression because the onset of bipolar disorder, first episode, and the worsening of episodes in bipolar patients, the postpartum period is the most likely time for those events to happen, so we need to be particularly sensitive. So when I, I looked at what other diagnoses do the women who were screened have, we already talked about how they were uh, already had recurrent episodes of major depression, and they were most likely to have an anxiety disorder. So in fact, we found that 83% you know, of our moms had an anxiety disorder in addition to depression, and it was generalized anxiety, panic, social phobia, OCD, PTSD. Uh, well, one out of 10 had substance use disorders and eating disorders. And this is common. When a woman has major depression, comorbidity is the rule rather than the exception. So in this work, we are always trying to look at women as, okay, she has perinatal depression, and we try to tailor the treatment package to what these comorbidities, both psychiatric and medical, are. So it, it is a, a very interesting and, and uh, very exciting work to do. So treatments. You all know that psychotherapy is a wonderful treatment. The first controlled study was done by Mike O'Hara in which he showed that interpersonal psychotherapy was a very good treatment for this illness. And the, um, the, the thing that I really like about that study is that the measures of relationship quality improved as well when uh, interpersonal psychotherapy was given to moms who had uh, postpartum depression, this was specifically. Now, interpersonal psychotherapy comes in a brief form. There are many iterations of IPT, but certainly IPT, cognitive behavioral therapy. We do mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy in the context of yoga. I have a clinician who's, who practices that. Those treatments, I think, are incredibly important for women and um, very often very acceptable to women, particularly during pregnancy when they would prefer to avoid medication. The, the most commonly used treatment for perinatal depression is antidepressant treatment, probably because they're, they're treated primarily in uh, primary care settings. So there aren't enough perinatal health specialists, perinatal um, psychiatrists. The vast majority of women with depression are seen by and treated by primary care practitioners. So in terms of thinking about pharmacotherapy, uh, the, the question I get a lot is, well, which drug is the best? And my response to that is, the one that works for her. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 as if there's some sort of a magic drug for uh, depression in pregnancy or postpartum. Our group tends to use a lot of sertraline, which is the most common drug used to treat postpartum depression in America and uh, probably in uh, Europe as well. It's been studied a fair amount, and it, it, it's more that there are some factors in that it does not tend to interact with other drugs that might be used by obstetricians to treat obstetrical problems, and it's been studied extensively in breastfeeding. Those seem to be the reasons that drive the use of sertraline uh, as the first-line drug. Uh, we actually looked at a study of sertraline versus an older tricyclic and found absolutely no difference in the response, the remission rates, and generally these drugs tend to have the same response and remission rates. It isn't like there's a drug that works way better than another drug, another antidepressant in a general population of patients. The one clue that I do use that, that helps, uh, and I'm, there are many reasons, is if there's a family member that responded well to a particular drug, that's important for two reasons. There may be reasons biologically that that's a good match for her physiology. It also is that there's a treatment allegiance, right? That worked for my mom. I, you know, I'm excited to try that. And whatever works, I don't care as long as she's well. <laughs> the other important point is 
one dose does not fit all. I see a lot of patients be put on the starting dose of sertraline. They get a little bit better, but they're referred to me because they're not responding. So although uh, we would like to believe one dose fits all, it doesn't, and there is a titration that needs to occur for the SSRIs as well, the serotonin drugs like sertraline. And so we looked at, in one of our trials, which were blinded, and we didn't know what the doses were. They were increased until the patient was in remission, good, you know, remission, no symptoms. What we looked, what we looked at was the dose. So only one woman, it, these are postpartum depressed women, only one woman had a full remission to a dose less than 100. Half needed 100, and the remainder needed a higher dose. This is because the the ability of those hepatic enzymes varies widely across patients, across women, across people in this room. You can give 50 milligrams to one woman, her level will be up here, and she'll say, geez, I've got side effects. You can give that same dose to somebody else, and they don't even know what's on board. So it's really important to know that one dose does not fit all, and that the starting dose of any antidepressant is not likely to work to create remission in most patients. What about breastfeeding? So early in my career, I did a lot of work looking at mother levels of antidepressants and baby levels of antidepressants to look at what is the actual exposure. That's, uh, there's a lot of data published on that now, but what's really happened since the Surgeon General's report and all the information on the value of breastfeeding, not only short but long-term for the moms, there's a huge push towards breastfeeding, and the general stance is that none of the antidepressants warrant discontinuation of breastfeeding. And I, that is my uh, general stance as well. We get interesting comments like, well, I took the medicine in pregnancy, I was comfortable for that, but I'm worried about taking it in breastfeeding. And, and it's really a common question. And so explaining that the exposure in breastfeeding is way less than what it is in pregnancy is a really important part of that conversation. So talking about the small amount after she takes the dose that goes through her whole physiologic system ends up in a nanogram per millimeter amount in the her serum, which works, but then gets into the breast milk in usually a lower amount, then goes into the baby's GI system and gets metabolized. And usually, at least for uh, sertraline paroxetine, we can't find the drug or the metabolite in the baby's serum. So not allowing that woman to breastfeed is, is really, um, uh, I, I think, a terrible um, lack of information providing. And I still see that. I still see it. People say, you can't breastfeed and take these medications. So, And then we have women not taking the medications, becoming very depressed, and they can't breastfeed anyway. So uh, this is still a, a common uh, issue and common concern. So let's talk about the pregnant women. It's only recently that there are government initiatives. So there's a current one called PREGLAC, which is from 21st Century Cures Act, where the third meeting of this group is going to be sometime in late February. And it's four meetings to pull together representatives from all government agencies that have anything to do with pregnant women to define what are the research and needs and what are the training needs to make sure that women who are pregnant don't continue to be a disadvantaged population in terms of public health and research. So some very exciting times. So your message it is getting through and the political action that all of you are doing, uh, I think I really, really appreciate it and it is making a difference. So I also talk about myths. So when I was in training, what, one of the most painful experiences was going to my supervisor, seeing a pregnant woman who was clearly depressed, suicidal ideation, describing it to my supervisor who said, Kathy, you have the diagnosis wrong. Pregnant women can't be depressed, they're fulfilled. <laughs> this is in the mid 80s. And, you know, that, that's actually what made me angry enough to think about no, I, I really need to, 
to do this. And I was told you're never going to make a career studying depression in pregnant women. Nobody wants to fund that. And it, it, these were things that are, that you know, I remember back. And then I look at you all and say, this is fabulous. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, it, it's a myth. And the myth then was pregnancy protects women from mental illness. So it was really the British that did a number of epidemiologic studies to debunk that, that allowed some of that work to happen here in America. So one of the questions that comes up is, if a woman's taking maintenance antidepressant and she gets pregnant and discontinues the medication, how likely is she to become depressed? So these were data from the, the Harvard group. Basically, they showed that if a woman discontinued her medication, her risk of becoming depressed was about two-thirds, 68%. If she continued her medication, her risk was 26%. Now, that's a huge difference, but um, it is actually Lee Cohen's paper. Lee Cohen was a little angry at me because I called him and said, why do those 26% of women who continue their medication, why are they getting sick? You know what I mean? That, that's really the question. You, you talked about, well, if you continue your medication, you've got one out of four chance of getting sick anyway. So uh, the reason for that I'll talk about later, which is something that we're studying now, but, but uh, this is really unacceptable as well. So clearly continuing your medication reduces the risk, but we need to do better than one out of four. All of you are very aware that um, depression, which is really a package, right? We've got the illness. We know from looking at the demographics that women who get depressed are more likely to have fewer resources. Probably also means women who get depressed are likely to have less access to health care. All of those things go into determining what is going to be that pregnancy outcome for that woman and her infant. So there are a whole number of risks that occur that if you say, well, what are the rates of these different uh, pregnancy adverse events in a population of depressed versus non-depressed, you'll find all of these things more common in those patients. And you know what an opportunity it is to do the work that you all are doing to address those risk factors and reduce the risk for these outcomes. Uh, we'll hear certainly much more later about something that that really has concerned me. And actually, I started my career doing an infant mental health program. That's, I didn't start in mom, maternal mental health. I started in infant mental health. And it was moms like this. That picture's dark. But you, know, you, you, you see a mom who has no emotional energy to give to that little newborn. And you know what's happening. The baby's brain depends upon the stimulation, learning about how does this world respond to me when I'm uncomfortable? How is this world, how am I going to engage in this world? It was really those kinds of um, experiences that, that led me into maternal mental health. I, I still do infant, but, but really focusing on the mom's disorders. One of the most poignant experiences I had was a mom who walked in and threw her newborn into my lap. Just, just you know, uh, it, it just a, a real severe uh, difficulty with attachment to the infant. So what about non-pharmacologic treatments? Certainly in my field, uh, you know, I have to be very attuned to non-drug treatments because if I can use a non-pharmacologic treatment, that is what I prefer for that woman if it's feasible um, and or if she prefers it. So certainly we use uh, psychotherapies, many different kinds. The mind, body, CBT, and yoga is a, a mindfulness-based program that's really popular, and I think the yoga and the group element of that are, contribute to its success. My junior faculty member is now doing that in a federally qualified health clinic, not only for pregnant women, but she was asked to expand it to men and women in the federally qualified health clinic. And that's, that's a really popular program. She has a waiting list for that. If I tried to do a medication trial, and I would not have a waiting list. So, so it's really matching the, the type of treatment to the need. There is a study um, that from a while ago that showed that acupuncture can be effective during pregnancy as well. Rachel Manber, who I think is at Stanford, she's, she's in California somewhere, but finding an acupuncturist who's comfortable can be difficult, certainly in Chicago, but there is data. 
about that. And aerobic exercise. Uh, there's a number of publications about the importance of exercise. And it, you know, combined exercise and a treatment, a, more of a cognitive treatment called behavioral activation <clears throat> that, that uh, are also helpful for depression. Doesn't mean that everybody that tries these things gets well, but there's certainly strategies to try if a woman prefers not to uh, take a pharmacologic treatment. The other area in which we do a lot of research is bright morning light therapy. <clears throat> now, uh, you, you all know about seasonal affective disorder and that this is a treatment for winter depression. But uh, what is more recently uh, established is that light therapy is also effective for non-seasonal depressions. And there's a big study in Canada. <clears throat> this is the reference that I have here with uh, Ray Lamb's work in which he showed efficacy for non-seasonal depression greater than for fluoxetine for light therapy administered in the morning. We've been doing work with uh, bright morning light therapy in pregnant women for some time, and I'll, I'll show you some data. But um, you might think, gee, in California we have a lot of light, we don't need it. Not really true, because here we are <clears throat> in artificial light, the light is outside. And one of the uh, investigators at UCSD, Barb Perry, is one of the more uh, established investigators in this field and conducts studies in her pregnant population regularly. So the woman would sit like this woman. It, this is a special 10,000 lux, very bright box, like on the June day in the middle of summer, 10 to 12 inches away from the screen, minimum of a half an hour in the morning. That's a starting dose. So there is distance from the box, the intensity of the light, and the time of day that you start. In, uh, there is a website um, that has an, it's um, uh, uh, probably on the next slide, but there is a metric that you can use where you plug in your sleep patterns and it will tell you what is the best time, the most potent time for you to deliver this package of intense light to the woman. And it has, definitely has serotonin effects, the light does, because you can reverse it with the anti-serotonergic drugs, and has activating effects. And you guys know that. I mean, you know if you're outside on a June day, you feel better than if you come to Chicago and have a you know cloudy, low, gray day. You just don't feel as good many people uh, respond to this. So it is a, a very uh, underutilized treatment for depression in pregnancy. And so here are the, the data that I wanted to show you. This is from a randomized trial that we could not get funded by our government, so we sent it over to a colleague in Austria who got the first, the highest score on this grant of the European Granting Society. <laughs> Pardon me, you know, a little comment. <laughs> but anyway, um, what, what Anna showed was that, you know, for these patients who were pregnant, they did have some placebo responses, this is reduction in scores, but they tended to stabilize not at a remission level. But the women who got the bright light continued, and I wish we would have continued it to week six because we didn't see when this ends. So now our protocols are six-week trials. And again, not every woman is going to respond to any of these treatments, but it gives another tool to try, particularly for those women who uh, uh, prefer not to have a medication intervention if the other treatments are not effective. This is a treatment for unipolar depressed women. So it's morning light for unipolar women. For bipolar women, morning light can be destabilizing. So just this month in our American Journal of Psychiatry, my colleague Dorothy Sitt published her trial of midday light for bipolar depression. So again, morning light can be too activating for bipolar patients. So we prefer to start with midday light, 15 minutes, and go slowly. Uh, so again, another reason to distinguish unipolar from bipolar disorder. But the response rates here um, to the active and the placebo light, the remission significantly higher for white uh, light. And uh, these rates of remission are similar to what you typically see in a randomized clinical trial of medication. So again, this is a really uh, important 
uh, treatment that we need to be using much more. And the sad part is there's not a lot of training in this. Uh, you know, Lightbox is $125, $150. There's not a huge marketing push to get this uh, implemented, but uh, it is an effective treatment. So in terms of medication treatment uh, for pregnant women, we really have done in some ways a, a public health disservice because through the years, particularly after the thalidomide problem, the thalidomide disaster, we said, oh, you know, pregnant women shouldn't take any medication. And certainly that's the ideal, right? But pregnant women get sick and sick women get pregnant. We've had a reticence to treat so physicians and prescribers are generally more worried about what if something bad happens because I wrote a script rather than what if something bad happens because I didn't write a script. So that, that's what I call the error of commission, doing something versus the error of not doing something. And there, there has been a very strong you know, I don't want to prescribe, uh, usually about concern about medical legal or other, other ethical kinds of concerns, which is interesting and, and certainly well-meaning, but then you have a pregnant patient in your office, and until more recently, you'd say, well, gee, you know, we don't study pregnant women, so I don't know anything. Good luck making your decision. This is part of what the PregLAC initiative that I described is about. This is a public health injustice. Women are a disadvantaged group if they're pregnant. So this is just beginning to be addressed at a policy level. So this uh, idea of pregnant women can't take medications is also a myth. Uh, exposure to medications, not iron, not multivitamins, exposure to medications is the rule rather than the exception in pregnant women. So what you're looking at here is data about women who data about pregnant women and their medication taking practices from 1976 to 2006. What you see here are what is the mean number of drugs that are taken by a pregnant woman across time and you see in this 2006 to 2008 it was over 4. In first trimester, it went from one and a half to just under three. And this is the percent of women who took four or more drugs in the first trimester. So this is really you know, across pregnancy and then first trimester, 30%. What is this? This is anti-nauseants, antibiotics, pain meds, uh, other medications, as seizure meds, antidepressants other medications that women take across pregnancy. So no woman should take a medication if she doesn't need it, but a woman who needs a medication to treat a disorder that happens in pregnancy that could compromise or affect the pregnancy needs to take that medicine. In of interest to this group is the rate of antidepressant treatment has gone up in the general population of women because these disorders are so very common in women of childbearing age. So here is that same uh, year frame, the 76, 78, and then 2006, 2008. This is the rate of antidepressant prescription, up to 8%. Now, if you say, how many of those women continue? It's about 2.5%. So this is initial exposure upon pregnancy, about two and a half continue. Sertraline is the most common antidepressant used, followed by, let's see, this is fluoxetine and citalopram and paroxetine. So again, in these data, sertraline were the most common medications. So there are a number of women who are exposed, a number of women who continue to take these medications across pregnancy. So what do we know? about uh, these medications and their benefits and risks in pregnancy. As we said, studies that say, here's a benefit of taking the medication, we haven't really asked those questions of the literature. What we ask is, what are the problems? So I'll talk about uh, what we know. And in fact, uh, this, is, this is the most important piece. Both the depression and all the sequelae, as well as the medications, can affect these outcomes. We have a difficult time sorting out, is it the medicine or is it all these other things? And the major problem in this literature is confounding meaning. If we're looking at SSRIs and we're saying, what is an outcome birth defects? 
If we look at a population of women who take SSRIs in general and women who don't take them and look at birth defects, you get about a 25% increase in risk for a birth defect. That was shown early on all through the early you know, 80s, 90s. The problem was, well, is it the SSRI or is it the obesity? Is it the exposure to other drugs? Is it the severe stress? So these factors uh, you know, were hypothesized to be affecting the rate of risk for that outcome. And there are a whole number of other variables that occur in women with depression that could be that Z factor in there. And not only that, they act collectively. So this is the problem we have in this literature. The best statement, I think, to summarize this is um, Michael Green's statement in the New England Journal a couple years ago. He's an obstetrician, and although this is you know, kind of uh, strangely framed, a serious concern or much ado about little, this comment, specific defects, if any, are rare and the absolute risks are small, still holds today. The reason he has if any in there is you cannot prove that there is absolutely no risk. Proving that null hypothesis is not possible. The best we can do is say, what is the level of increased risk a woman might incur? So that's why that's there. But at this point, the, uh, the, uh, the relationship between SSRI exposure and birth defects is really, uh, there's really no convincing data of association. And this is really the critical study. This is an epidemiologist from Harvard who looked at Medicaid patients, um, you know, just under a million patients in America. And she said, what is the risk for cardiac defects, which, were the, which was the risk of concern, and in fact, the most common kind of malformation that occurs in newborns. What is the risk in a population Again, exposed to SSRIs versus not exposed. And you get this, again, this 25% risk. Okay, if you stop there, you'd say, oh, SSRI's bad, you get cardiac defects. What she then did was say, I am going to take the population of women who only have a diagnosis of major depression, not other diagnoses, other indicators, just major depression, and the with SSRIs and major depression with no SSRIs. And so the level of risk just doing that adjustment came down quite a bit to 1.12, meaning there were 12% basically more in the exposed population, not significant because it contains one. But more importantly, she did a statistical test called propensity score matching, which takes a large population. There what you do is say, all right, I'm going to compare strata of women. So I'm going to compare those women who take an SSRI, who have major depression, who are obese and exposed to other drugs, and compare them to women who have exactly those same variables, but they're not taking an SSRI. So it's a way to use statistics because this is not a population that we can randomize. So when she did that, which controls as best we can for those confounders, the odds ratio goes to uh, very low, non-significant. And all of the other reports of possible associations became non-significant as well. This is a key paper in our literature and one that's incredibly important to be aware of. Thankfully, this investigator has now put out a report on antipsychotics and on stimulants in this large database. So finally, we have some data. There are also many other medications she includes in her supplement tables. So if you're interested in risk for bupropion or mirtazapine, that's in her tables as well. It's a landmark study. Uh, I know that uh, many people are aware of Mother to Baby, used to be Organization of Teratology Information Specialists. Uh, Joy, I'm to give you a special hello from Robert Felix, <laughs> who says, make sure I say hi. An incredibly important resource where they can, they're available for a live chat. They're available to uh, talk to you about medications in pregnancy, not only uh, antidepressants and psychotropics, but any med or any combination. They have fact sheets on depression as well as the medicine. So they're very attentive to the risks of diseases. So you can give your patients fact sheets on these as they as to help them make the decisions that they need to and it's a really good thing to know about and put in your records for medical legal documentation as well and they're they're wonderful what about preterm birth 
The association between SSRIs and preterm birth has the same story as for birth defects. Basically, when you adjust for all of the variables that occur in depression that affect the rate of preterm birth, the difference between exposed and non-exposed, uh, the rates go down. And we showed this in a study we did a while ago where uh, we showed that the rate of preterm birth in either depressed, no medication patients or uh, medicated throughout pregnancy was essentially the same and very different from non-depressed, non-medicated patients. And in fact, in the study that I showed you, that landmark study, Krista Hybrex looked at the same issue of if you do propensity score matching for preterm birth as well, you get the same rate in exposed versus non-exposed uh, women. So this is, again, an opportunity to address the factors that occur with depression as a potential way to reduce preterm birth. There's another interesting study, and this is uh, an interesting one because it begins to ask questions about might there be an advantage to treating women, whether it's with medication or not. And what this investigator did was look at what is the risk for preterm birth in medicated versus non-medicated patients and found some uh, evidence that, in fact, uh, the SSRI-treated mothers, although their babies had neonatal complications, they had a lower risk for preterm birth. So again, beginning to ask the question that we hope is true, which is if we treat these women, let's have some data to show what outcomes are improved. What about mental and motor development? The good news is there's the, the few studies that have been done show that the mental development of SSRI-exposed children when they were exposed as fetuses has been in the normal range, and that's good news. The question is not about, motor, about mental development. There's, a, there's some question about motor development. And just with respect to the mental development, the other concern is a mother who is depressed raising a child brings risk factors as well. And in this uh, investigation, what was done was the investigator looked at uh, SIB pairs, where the mother took medication in, for the pregnancy of one SIB, but not the other, and the, uh, asked the question, well, what, is, what are the IQs like? They were identical, no difference. Uh, so that, that's kind of an interesting finding, because you're using SIBs to kind of semi-control the environmental factors. And then there was no difference in the rate of problem behaviors on the child behavior checklist, which is a standard measure. But what they did find was that the uh, level of severity of depression in pregnancy was related to behavioral problems. So again, if you're looking at outcomes, so always looking at not only the exposure in pregnancy, but what happens in the post-birth period. But this uh, was somewhat reassuring data. This is a study that we published. So we looked at, it's the only longitudinal study, so we looked at Bailey exams, uh, infant exams, at uh, 3, 6, 12, and 18 months. And these, all these red lines in these little champagne bubbles, all it means is that if you look at those red lines, which are the average lines, there's no difference in those patterns. And they're all kids in the normal range of development who were either not exposed to either depression or med, exposed to med, or exposed to just depression. So that's consistent with uh, data that are out there. Where the potential issue is, and this is about half the reports found what we did, that if you look at the exposed kids, that's these orange, orange lines, <laughs> as opposed to the non-exposed or the depressed kids, kids of depressed mothers, Around a year, beginning in six months, you see some motor difficulties, meaning they walk maybe a week later, they sit later, they, they have a little less fine motor control, and that's been reported in a number of cross-sectional studies. What we saw, though, is they catch up across time. So there is a need for more studies to look at the effect of prenatal exposure on the motor system. However, the other thing that's true is these kids would never be picked up on any kind of a screen. They're absolutely normal. They're well within the normal range, and they catch up. But I think we, that's the area where we need more information about developmental processes. 
A while ago, autism was a big concern. I think we've looked at every environmental exposure for autism, as we should, because it's an incredible problem, very common, a crisis in our public health uh, system. But in fact, the relationship between SSRI and ex exposure and autism has been essentially uh, shown to be very little, if any. And these are the studies that have shown that, again, looking at um, strategies like comparing uh, siblings, exposed, not exposed, also looking very carefully at family history of autism. It is the case that women with depression have a higher risk for having a child with autism as well. So that factor has to be taken out. But it is not something that is um, uh, being put being followed up or researched, well, it's not true. There is another study looking at it. In fact, Krista Hybrex, with this large sample, is looking at it, but it isn't a, 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 the most pressing concern in this literature. So I mentioned neonatal discontinuation signs, and this is a set of signs, restlessness, rigidity, and tremor, that occur in some group, in some newborns, even if they're not exposed, but it occurs more commonly in kids who are exposed to SSRIs. And this, we published a, a paper on this in 2005, and I'm sad to say there's not a whole lot of uh, movement in this literature since that time. Uh, there's no operational definition for this, so you'll hear it called neonatal withdrawal, neonatal abstinence, neonatal adaptation, you'll hear it. And, and so this is something that, that is part of the grant that we're working on now. In fact, it's most likely based on uh, a study that was done at Brown by Amy Salisbury where she looked at these signs every few days across a 30-day period. It's most likely that these things are not so transient just two weeks. There are signs that do last longer and uh, it's most likely to be excess serotonin from prenatal exposure that is responsible for the majority of these signs rather than withdrawal, that is a, a, a sudden drop in the level creates symptoms. Now the other thing is it depends on the drug. So for a drug like paroxetine, you certainly can see both the serotonin effects and it's rapidly excreted so you may also see a rebound effect from that drug. So we're trying to figure out which mother-baby pairs are at risk, how do we deal with it, and how do we tailor the drug to the mom to minimize the risk for the baby. Serious adverse consequences of exposure are really rare though. Even in the FDA database where people report adverse effects, we found one out of 313 reports led to the need for some medical NICU uh, admission. That said, we have a regional NICU and we see a lot of these babies. So it is an important problem, relatively rare, but certainly an important problem. Um, again, restlessness, rigidity, and tremor, neurological, muscular, difficulty breathing, difficulty feeding, um, and again, uh, tends to be tends to decrease across time. Most disappear in two weeks, but there are some longer lasting effects. So um, I need to move a little bit more uh, to the punchlines here. So essentially what uh, I am working on now is how do we ask questions more like, how do we get the best outcomes for the mother and baby in multiple domains, knowing that if we just focus on one, that we can't get a complete picture? Like if, if we say, oh, well, we're most worried about neonatal effects, and that drives treatment decision making, that's really not the way we need to do it. We need to look at all the potential risks, all the potential benefits, and put that together in a package for our patients. And we need numeric data on how common some of these adverse effects are, including going the other side and saying, here is the likelihood that you will be well, that you will be able to do these things, function in this way to help your child develop. So putting together a comprehensive picture, which outcomes are better with treatment than without, gets really important. One of the final things I want to talk about is um, some work we've done over the last five years in which 
we uh, looked at what are the concentrations of, this is fluoxetine, sertraline, and citalopram. So this is fluoxetine or Prozac, sertraline or Zoloft, citalopram or Celexa. And what we did was we looked at what is the concentration in the mom's blood at 20 weeks pregnancy, 30 weeks, 36, and at delivery, and then postpartum. So this is all tracking the concentrations across pregnancy. So this is a drug that lasts a long time in the body, but you can see 36 weeks in delivery, its concentrations are really low. And so if the woman needs this much to be well, she's going to be at risk for getting symptomatic here. Sertraline is even, it has a shorter half-life, and here at 20 weeks, we see a real, you know, slide. And we are very commonly getting calls from outside uh, docs saying, she was fine on her sertraline, now she's halfway through pregnancy and she's not doing well, what should I switch her to? Don't switch her, increase the dose. And typically an increase in the dose, within a couple days the mom recovers. So we're looking at how do we need, we monitor our patients every month and if they have signs of recurrence, they call us, we change the dose. It's really not ideal, right? We really need to be looking at how do we manage the dose so that the woman's concentration is stable throughout pregnancy? And it's the same for all of these drugs. And that's because the liver enzymes that metabolize these drugs are activated in pregnancy. And so we need to be sure that if we're giving a woman a medicine that it does what it's supposed to be doing and we're not just giving exposure for no benefit. So finally, um, what, what I've talked about is kind of a limited uh, number of principles uh, really more here and maybe here, uh, but this whole picture I think is is what people in this room are involved in. That is all these things are nice, but if we really want the woman to get better, she's got to be embedded in a system of care, including her neighborhood, her peers. She's got to be embedded in a community of care that helps her continue to be well. And that's why I really like you know, working with Joy and 2020 Mom because you give us that whole perspective. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your attention and leave you with, with this thought.